Okay, brethren, um, apologies for the delay. Zoom had changed the, the setup of my meeting. So just give me a minute again to share my screen. Please, can you confirm if you can see my slides? We can see it, Ma. Okay, thank you. So we're back in Mark chapter 14, which um, was started for us two Wednesdays ago. And today we're doing the part two. I'm not going to go through what was done two weeks ago because we have the recording. I'll just go straight into verse 26. And this is what it says where if you want to follow on my screen, you can follow along. I'll be reading mainly from the Amplified Classic Edition. So Mark 14 from verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is referring to the Lord Jesus and the disciples after they had had the Last Supper. This is what it's referring to here when it says after they the they there is referring to the Lord Jesus and the disciples. Verse 27. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away this night. That is, you will be caused to stumble and will begin to distrust and desert me. In some Bible translations like the King James, it says you'll be offended with me. For it stands written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised to life, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said to Jesus, even if they all fall away and are caused to stumble and distrust and desert you, yet I will not do so. And Jesus said to Peter, truly I tell you, this very night before a cock crows twice, you will utterly deny me disclaiming all connection with me three times. But Peter said more vehemently and repeatedly, even if it should be necessary for me to die with you, I will not deny or disown you. And they all kept saying the same thing. So brethren, just to remind us um, what Dr. Duru taught us two weeks ago, before this time, they've sat at the Last Supper and the Lord Jesus has warned them that in their midst, in the midst of the 12 disciples, that in their midst was a betrayer. And this must have been shocking news to believe that within the 12 that had been chosen amongst all the disciples that the Lord Jesus had. There must have been great shock to know that amongst them was somebody who was going to betray Jesus. And then now Jesus is warning them again about something that also is mind blowing. He's saying to them, not just one person, not two person, but all of you, you will all fall away this night. So all the 11, he says to them, you will fall away. The 11 of you will be caused to stumble. You will begin to distrust me. You will lose faith in me and you will desert me. For the scripture says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And you can imagine the horror of the disciples hearing this, that they were going to be deserting Jesus. Remember, up until this time, they go everywhere with him. And sometimes when he, where he doesn't take everybody, he will take certainly Peter, James, and John. And so to think that even this top three were going to desert him was something quite, you know, bewildering. But then Peter begins to vehemently, you know, deny that he could ever do such a thing and then he says even if all the other ones fall away i would never i will not desert you but the lord jesus answered him straight and said before the cock crossed twice you will utterly deny me you will disclaim all connection with me you will refuse that you even know me but peter wasn't convinced he kept vehemently denying this and repeating that even if it means me dying with you I will not deny you and I will not disown you. And then the Bible says all the other disciples kept saying the same thing. Now, Jesus was quoting from Zechariah in the book of Zechariah. So remember, one of the things we found here as we've been studying the Gospels 
is that we see a lot of fulfillment of biblical prophecy. The prophecies that were given by Zechariah, by Isaiah, and the other prophets of old, they were all getting fulfilled. And so one of the prophecies that gets fulfilled here is Zechariah 13, um, verse 7. And when you go to that scripture, if I read it um, for us in the King James Version, the Bible says this, Zechariah 13 from verse 7. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. So again, Yahweh Saboeth is the one saying it. He's the one waking up the sword against his shepherd. So Yahweh Saboeth, God the Father, is raising up a sword against the shepherd, who in this instance is the Lord Jesus. And he says, smite the shepherd, smite the Messiah, and the sheep will be scattered. Smite the Messiah and his disciples, his followers will be scattered. And he says, I will turn my hand upon the little ones. So you can see there what the Lord is saying. There was a, already a prophecy. But when we go to Zechariah 11, if you read it from verse 4, to verse 14, which we haven't got enough time to read now, but you could read in your own time. Zechariah 11 from verse 4, you see there that the Lord begins to speak. He says, thus saith the Lord my God, feed the flock of the slaughter. And he begins to speak again in there about the coming of the good shepherd who is the Lord Jesus, because before this time, the sheep were being shepherded by wolves, really, who were not looking after the sheep. And by the sheep here, the Lord was relating to the people of Israel, his children. But when you look in Zechariah 11 from verse 12, he says, and I say unto them, if you think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear, for they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And this is talking about the Messiah being sold out. And the Lord said unto me, cast it unto the porter, a goodly price that I was priced at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the porter in the house of the Lord. So you can see that in Zechariah, there are quite a lot of prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. There are prophecies about his betrayal. Now here in Mark 14, Zechariah's prophecy has a double fulfillment because when Jesus was crucified, not only were the disciples scattered, mm -hmm. But within 40 years, the entire nation of Israel was scattered after the Romans attacked Jerusalem and, and the temple. And so 40 years after the crucifixion, the nation of Israel scattered. Remember, all those Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all those religious leaders that were continually and constantly op opposing the Lord Jesus. We've read it in previous chapters. The reason why they were opposing him was because they were thinking they were trying to preserve the status quo and they kept saying we don't want the romans to come here and take away our freedom blah blah but you see when you when you go against the ways of god the thing you're afraid of it comes upon you these people they were opposing the messiah thinking that by opposing the lord jesus they would be able to preserve their status quo but they couldn't because the romans did attack jerusalem and the temple and we know if you've studied history or current affairs, and even if you see what's happening now within Gaza with Palestine and Israel, you will know all the history that it was not until May 1948 that the scattered Israelites were divinely and supernaturally, you know, placed back in the sovereign nation of Israel. But since 1948, they've had no peace from their neighbors and the people who don't want them to be there. So you can see that Zechariah's prophecy was fulfilled twice. The disciples scattered when the shepherd was smitten, when they, when they, 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 they hit the shepherd, the Lord Jesus, the disciples were scattered during that time, but also the whole nation of Israel was um scattered and you might think okay so how is this relevant to us but you know one thing that it tells us number one is that God is not finished with Israel sometimes there are some theologians and some bible teachers who teach replacement theology or supersessionism and they talk about how the church has replaced Israel in the plan of God and that Israel are no longer a chosen nation of God but that is a misinterpretation of the scriptures 
it is a lie of the devil. Israel is still at the center of God's plan. And even when, you know, on Sunday in church, CJ was talking to us about, you know, the great tribulation and all that. And we know that part of the reasons of the great tribulation is so that Israel can come back to the Lord, so that Israel can come back to God, the great tribulation and the suffering that they will go through during the times of the Antichrist are really meant to turn their heart back to God. So anybody who hates Israel and wants to see Israel destroyed is wrong. And they need to go and read um the book of Zechariah and the Old Testament, and also to read the book of Revelation to know that actually the Lord is not planning to destroy Israel at all. Israel is part of God's plan. And even today, what's going on, please put that aside and still know that God has a plan for Israel. Going back again to our scripture, Jesus says to them, you will all fall away this night. You'll be caused to stumble. You will begin to distrust and desert me. For it stands written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised to life, I'll go before you into Galilee. Let's look at that phrase that the Lord Jesus uses there in verse 27. You will all fall away this night. When you look at that phrase, we'll fall away. Um, when we are actually translating it directly into English, this phrase means to be offended or to be made to stumble. It's from the Greek word scandalizo or from the word scandalon. Scandalon means a trap. It means to put a snare or a stumbling block in the way. It's from this word that we get the English word scandalized, where, you know, when people are scandalized, you know, it's like they're absolutely offended in a moral sense they can't believe that such a thing could happen but here in the context of the scripture it means to put a snare in the way um it means to 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 cause offense and then that offense causes one to stumble i first came across this greek word scandalizo uh, or scandalon many years ago when i read a book by perry stone um which is called The Bait of Satan. I really recommend that book to anybody who would want to study this further and also to get to understand the trap of unforgiveness and carrying offenses. It's a really, really good book. And it took some um, time, you know, to really go into Bible study to explain scandal on. And I remember when I read that book, it amazed me because I started to see that indeed, um, the bait of Satan is offense. Satan gets people offended with God. You know, when people start to lose faith, it's because they somehow think God, you know, is betrayed them. God is not actually true to his word. He's not doing what they thought he would do. You know, things are not going the way they thought. They're just like, you know, what's the point of even being a Christian? What's the point of praying? God hasn't done this. God has Sometimes people get offended with God. And then never mind getting offended with each other as brethren. And, you know, when we get offended and we don't deal with that offense, it really creates an opportunity for the enemy. That's why the Bible warns us in the book of Ephesians, be ye angry, but sin not. Neither let the sun go down on your wrath. So on your wrath, it says, you know, do not give the devil a foothold. So offense, scandal on, becomes a trap that the enemy would use to trap people, to delay, to cause problem. So scandalizo, like I said before, is derived from that Greek word scandalon, which refers to the stick in a trap on which the bait is placed. I don't know if any of you um, ever saw when you were growing up or even now where people set traps maybe for mice or rats or things like that. And if they're, they're, they're baiting, let's say a rat, they would put like, a peanut on the bait. And if the, the rat comes to try and take the peanut, it then triggers the trap that then holds the rat and kills it. Or if an animal that is being hunted, maybe the animal loves meat or something, then they would put a little piece of meat. And then when that animal tries to get the meat, then the trap closes. It springs up and it shuts. And that animal then is captured or killed or whatever else. So, again, it follows that idea that Satan 
plays the same game with us, you know, that the offense or whatever it is that you are, you know, upset about or morally offended about, it is then used for the enemy to catch you. And it's like putting a stumbling block in your um, path of righteousness, in your path to destiny, and it becomes an impediment, which doesn't allow you to get to where God wants you to get to. So in this present context now, coming back to Mark 14, and we've got the disciples with the Lord Jesus warning them that this very night, you, you will, you're going to be offended with me, you'll fall away, um, you will experience a scandal on. What Jesus was saying was that, you know, all of them um, would be made to deny him by a series of circumstances that were going to play out. And you can see all the uses of that word scandal on in the Bible verses that I've listed there in Mark. You know, there's different uses of it. And in the book of um, Matthew, you will see where scandal on is, met, is, is, is used. Um, Bible teacher Hebert emphasizes that this verb scandalizo, um, which has the basic idea of being caught in a trap, does not mean that the disciples would feel offense at Jesus personally here in Mark 14. It doesn't mean that personally they'd be offended with Jesus, but that they would be caught and overwhelmed by what would happen to Jesus that very night. It would stagger their faith and shake their confidence in the truth that Jesus was the Messiah. And so the events of that night were going to challenge their loyalty to Jesus. And no, child of God, even as we read this, we mustn't just cast our eye back to that night and the Garden of Gethsemane, but we must also think our, about ourselves today and now. Think about some of the things that have happened to you or that might be currently happening to you. Are there things that have caught you off guard? Are there things that you find overwhelming? Are there things that cause you to stagger in your faith? And, you know, no longer become confident that what God promised me he's going to do. Are there things that are shaking your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ and the mighty God, the father that we serve? Are there things that are causing you to wonder whether he's going to come through for you? If there's something like that, remember this word scandal on and resist the devil. And I pray that when we get chance to pray at the end, this is one thing that we're going to pray about, that whatever the circumstance, whatever is the situation, you are not going to fall into the bait of Satan, but that our faith will remain unshaken. And then the Lord Jesus said to them, quoting from the Zechariah I read before, you know, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now, don't miss the fact that the one who made this prophetic pronouncement in Zechariah to strike down the shepherd via a violent death is none other than God the Father. So the shepherd would not be smitten contrary to divine providence. No, it wasn't like some strange random occurrence that happened that nobody had prepared for. No, the shepherd, the Messiah Jesus, was going to face a violent death and this was the plan of God for him. This was the plan of God all along. This wasn't like um, God being on the back foot and just suddenly thinking, okay, what shall we do? What shall we do? No, this was the plan of God. And when we go to um, Romans 5, you see that in Romans 5, what, what it says about God and, you know, how dependable God is. In Romans 5 from verse 6, the Bible says about you and I, for when we were still without strength, I'm reading the New King James uh, Version, for when we were still without strength, in due time, at the appointed time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. So this was the plan of God, even with the disciples denying him, even with people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all that. God already had a plan to let Jesus die for us. So smiting the shepherd was the plan of God. So when Jesus quotes Zechariah 13 from verse 7 and depicts himself as the shepherd and the disciples as the sheep, you know, this was like 500 years before this event would transpire. So that just, you know, let it sink in. Just think about it. 
that 500 years before this incident, God already saw it happen. He already had a plan for it. And the end had already been decided. And it was a good ending, resurrection morning. And Jesus being seated in heavenly places far above all principality and power. And us being raised together with him, sitting in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. So this plan was already there. Zechariah saw it 500 years before the event would transpire. Now, when you think about this, the unexpected smiting of the shepherd for the disciples who would not have understood this. They wouldn't have understood the prophecy. They wouldn't even have understood what Zechariah had said. That plan, you know, it was like, okay, for the, for the disciples, they were bewildered. The day they saw Jesus being arrested, you know, they were bewildered. They scattered in different directions. But Jesus gave them a forewarning. He told them, you know, that this was going to happen. That's what he was telling them here in Mark 14. Now, for you and I, this ought to give us great confidence that God's word is sure. And if 80% of all the prophecies about Christ Jesus to date, to this day, 2024, 80% of the prophecies about Jesus have been perfectly fulfilled. Remember, going back to when we even looked at the study of Matthew, even just the birth of Jesus fulfilled quite a lot of prophecies. His crucifixion fulfilled quite a lot of prophecies. If 80% of these prophecies have already been perfectly fulfilled, it must give you and I the conviction that the remaining 20% will certainly be fulfilled. They will not go unfulfilled because if, you know, this is a, for people who study mathematics, people who do statistics, People who love numbers, you know, look at it. If 80% of something has already been fulfilled, then it tells you that, look, the 20% is almost negligent. You know, it's like negligible. Um, sorry, negligible. It's negligible. It's not even something we ought to worry about because if 80% has been fulfilled, then what will it take for the 20% to be fulfilled? You know, it's going to happen. And we see that, in Revelation 19, that same shepherd who was struck down by his enemies will himself strike down his enemies with the sharp sword that comes from his mouth. Revelation 19, 15. Same prophecy we find in um, Psalm 110 from verse 1. The Lord, the Lord God the Father said to my Lord God the Son, sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And says, you know, that rod will go out of Zion, you know, and he says, rule thou in the midst of your enemies. And he talks about the enemies of Jesus becoming his footstool. All this is prophesied. It will come to pass. One day was the crucifixion, but actually the present reality that we have is that Jesus is sitting in heavenly places in a place of authority and power and that he is going to come again. And like we were studying on Sunday, you know, about the tribulation and, and the timeline that CJ was showing us, we know that the end will come. Um, we know the battle of Armageddon will take place. The millennium realm will take place. The millennium reign, um, the great white throne judgment um, and the final judgment of uh, the enemy and all his agents and all his angels. They will be thrown in the great lake of fire and then we'll have a new heavens and a new earth. So all these things, they will happen. Coming again to the scripture, Mark 14 now, let's look at verse 28. Jesus says, look, the shepherd will be smitten, the sheep will scatter, but after I am raised to life. So he told them that if I get killed, I will resurrect. After I am raised, he didn't say um, in the event that I'm raised, no. Firmly speaking, after I am raised, I will go before you into Galilee. Again, he was forewarning the disciples, letting them know it wasn't going to end with him being smitten. He was going to rise again. And we know he did. Again, another fulfilled word of God. If Jesus fulfilled that, he'll, he'll also fulfill every other thing. Going on to verse 29 now. But Peter said to the Lord Jesus, even if they all fall away, and are caused to stumble and distrust and desert you. Yet I, Peter, will not do so. I'm not like all them. I love you, Jesus. I'm not like this other gang. If this gang's going to disown you, that's not me. That's not my style. But Jesus said, Peter, truly I tell you this very night, 
Before a cock crows twice, you will utterly deny me, disclaiming all connection with me three times. Not once, not twice, but three times. But even though it came from the mouth of the Lord, Peter knew that the Lord Jesus often exhibited insight and knowledge that nobody else had. Even though this came from the Lord, Peter still had the temerity to argue. He still had the confidence and the guts to say, no, Lord, I know you're right about a lot of things, but you're wrong about me. I will not deny you. He had that kind of confidence. Bible says here in the Amplified, he said more vehemently. In other words, he put more force in his words and repeatedly, he says, even if it should be necessary for me to die with you, Lord Jesus, I will not deny or disown you. And, you know, kept saying the same thing. And the Lord was just like, mm. Mm. you will deny me. Now, when you look at Peter's response, although there was genuine love for Christ behind Peter's protest, it revealed his sad ignorance about his own weakness. And that's how a lot of us are. We are sadly ignorant about our own weaknesses. And maybe that's one of the prayers we'll pray tonight. Holy Spirit, help me. You know, with his boasting, Peter arrogantly elevated himself above the other disciples. He felt that, look, them guys, they're a, they are all capable of denying Jesus. But me? Nope. I'm not like them. And sometimes we're like that. We hear a story about somebody sinning or failing or doing things that are not consistent with being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're like, you know, hmm, you know, what sort of a Christian is that? You know, hmm. The type of Christians we have these days, it's unbelievable. And, you know, sometimes we rant and rave on social media. We post it on Twitter. We go on Instagram. We're dismayed at these sinners and we assume that we are better than them. And this exhibits not just mere self-sufficiency and self-reliance, but an arrogant estimate of our own strength. Same as Peter. He had this strange estimate where he esteemed himself to be better than the other disciples and that's why in John 21 15 after the resurrection the Lord Jesus comes to him and said you know Simon Simon lovest thou me more than these in other words do you love me more than these other disciples and by then Peter was humbled you know he had, he had got to the point where he now you know he'd experienced the failure and he was humbled more humble. And you know, the Bible says to us, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and in juices and he will lift you up. We ought to always humble ourselves under God's hand, not be trusting ourselves too much. And he says, you know, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If we humbly accept that we need the grace of God for everything and that we cannot trust ourselves, we cannot rely on ourselves for anything, then the grace of God will help us to scale through the temptations, through the priesthood of Jesus, whom the Bible tells us, you know, even though he was in the flesh like us once upon a time and was tempted in all points like us, that he never actually sinned. And because he overcame, he is able to succor us and to help us when we are tempted. So here we see that Peter did not wait on God. As soon as he heard that there would be a denial, he just stood with his self-confidence. He focused in his mind where the test would come from. But the test didn't come the way he was expecting it. And many times we are the same. Sometimes, you know, we think, do you know what? I'm a mature child of God. You know, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I have the gifts of the Spirit. I have this. I have that. And then you think the test will come in the way where you feel like you've built some muscle. And then curveball comes. The test doesn't come where you thought it would come from. And that's why we continually need to rely on God. Often we are not tested in a way that we expected to be tested. We are often, you know, kind of really taken aback at the things that are happening to us, whether in our marriages or with our children, with our professional jobs, with businesses or whatnot. You will often find that the test comes in a way that you least expected it. Peter said to the Lord, even if it means dying for you, I'm going to die for you. I will lay down my life for your sake. Now, his declaration came from a good place. You know, he really did love Jesus, but he was ignorant. He was ignorant about what he was capable of. 
when confronted with the level of fear that confronted them that night, the scandal on that I've explained before, you know, Jesus had a deeper knowledge of who Peter was. And he says, the cock will not crow till you have denied me three times. Jesus knew this, but Peter did not know this about himself. He did not know what he was capable of doing, you know, and most times we need Jesus to help us. I remember when I was younger, you know, in my twenties, I, I had this dream. And in this dream, I saw myself doing something that I felt, you know, like oh, as a proper Christian, I'd never do that. And in that dream, I was like seeing myself, watching myself doing this thing that I thought I could never do. And then in that dream, it's like I had an encounter with the Lord. And I said, Lord, I don't know who that is that I'm watching, but that's not me because I would never do such a thing. And in that dream, the Lord was teaching me that actually don't think in that manner because that's how people fall. That's how they fail. Never ever sit and say, I can't do this. I can't do that. It's all by the grace of God. So every day we have to rely on the grace of God for everything. Even the things that you think are not a temptation for you. We need the grace. That's why every morning we wake up at 6 a.m. and join the prayer line and start the day with prayer because we don't trust ourselves to just fall out of the house, you know, and think, okay, we can handle it. We got it under control. No, every day we need fresh grace for the day ahead. We can't trust ourselves that, you know, I'm not going to be crazy angry. I'm not going to do crazy things. I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to fornicate, commit adultery, blah, blah. No, we can't trust ourselves. We have to rely on the strength of Jesus. Jesus knew Peter more than himself. But Peter wasn't ready to receive it. For you and I, Jesus knows us more than ourselves. The spirit of truth knows. So why don't we always go to the Lord and say, Lord, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ancient thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the path everlasting. Lord, I can't trust myself. I need you to show me and to then help me. As you show me, give me the grace to overcome. Because the Lord knows us more than we know ourselves. He knows what we're capable of. He knows, child of God, there are some believers who were once upon a time on fire for Jesus. They were in every prayer meeting. They were evangelizing. They were doing all sorts. And today they are backslidden. And they're not even in church. They're not serving God. They're serving the enemy. And they never thought they'd get there. They thought they were full of all things good. But our enemy doesn't rest. Remember, he puts the bait, the scandal on to trap us. And some people have been so trapped that they've given up on the Lord Jesus. They've backslidden. I know some people that when I first gave my life to Christ, we worshiped together. Today, they are nowhere near church. I know some people I worshipped with here in Manchester. And we used to be in prayer meetings together. Sunday would be in morning service, night service. During the week, we would be in vigils and all sorts, serving God. And today, nowhere near church. Some of them, they go to spiritists openly. Some of them are going to evil altars openly. They've lost their faith. If you had told them years ago that they would be in the state they are in now, they'd have thought you're joking. So Jesus knows us more than we know ourselves. And we need to receive when he's revealing to us that there's an area in our lives that needs attention. So let's just focus on Peter's fall here a minute, you know, before we carry on. Um, I, I found this and I thought it's really, really good and it applies to us. So this was suggested by James Smith um, in Handfuls of Purpose. And he says, Peter's fall, you know, the steps in Mark 14, the downward steps. Number one, self-confidence, self-confidence. You know, he was convinced. He says, if all these other ones, if all these other ones fall away, Lord, I am not falling away. Self-confidence will destroy any child of God. We cannot have self-confidence. We can be confident in him who created us, who strengthens us, who lifts us. We cannot be self-confident. We need the confidence of Jesus. We need Holy Spirit. When you read Proverbs 28, 26, it says, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. If you walk wisely, you walk by the Spirit and let the Spirit help you. It says, if you trust your own heart, you are a fool. 
if you say, this is how I feel, this is what my heart is telling me, that's what I'm convinced. You're a, the Bible says you are a fool, not me. We cannot trust our own hearts because our hearts can be deceptive. Our own ideas can deceive us. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, the Bible says, let him that thinks he stands, take heed, lest he fall. If you are thinking, do you know what? I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm not the type to be committing adultery or fornication. I'm not the type to be stealing. I'm not the type to be doing all these abominations that some Christians are doing. Bible says, let him that thinks he stands, take heed, lest he fall. So we cannot, you know, be confident in our own strength, we've got to be confident in him who is able to keep us from falling. And so we are confident in him, not us. Number two, Peter had proud boasting when he said to the Lord Jesus vehemently, I cannot, I cannot deny you. Even if it means me dying with you, I will. That was just boasting because he couldn't do that. Lack of watchfulness that we will see in the verses to come that the Lord Jesus tells them, watch with me. Pray with me, watch with me, pray with me. But they're all sleeping. Nobody is praying. You know, if you are not watching and praying, you sleep a lot. You know, any believer sleeping all night and then all day doing other things, never praying. Just know you're in trouble. You're an accident waiting to happen. And that's not a curse. It's just to tell us that we're going to be in trouble. And so please, let's be watchful. Don't be lulled into a false sense of security. Some people, they only use the fire brigade method to pray. They only pray if they're in danger or when they have an evil diagnosis or they pray when they don't have papers and they want a British passport or whatever else. They don't pray for anything else. If they get the things they prayed for, oh, glory, hallelujah, testimony Sunday. After that, just carry on, no more praying. We cannot be like that because that's what led to Peter's downfall. Next thing, cowardliness. Jesus, you know, the, the gospel of Jesus is about a gospel of courage. We cannot be cowardly. Remember what the Lord said to Joshua before they would go into the promised land. He says, be strong and be very courageous. We need courage because we're in a world where we're going to be challenged. If you give up at the slightest hint of trouble, you're going to be in trouble. Next thing, Peter had ungodly company. When he was warming himself around that fire, he wasn't with godly people. At that point where the disciples were going in many different directions, what they needed to do was to form their own group and begin to pray together as a group of disciples. Sitting with ungodly people because there's a fire that they built and you're cold and you want to sit by their fire is going to lead to trouble so for each and every one of us think about who are the voices around you what's the company you're keeping and then of course he denied the lord despite the warning and then he was overwhelmed with sorrow and sometimes those are the steps that you know if k is not taken every other child of god can go through J.C. Ryle says, look, this Peter's denial sounds like it was improbable. You know, remember, Jesus has already told him, the prophecies told him, clearly, you're going to deny me. Peter should have been making every effort to pray for grace, to not deny the Lord. Sometimes we receive prophecies and we're not even praying about the prophecy. We hear it, we shelve it we've been it we're not taking it seriously but whenever you hear a prophecy or god gives you a message it's time to pray you know the fact that peter could deny the master after the plain warning he had been given is a, is a bit shocking and you know that's what happens with us sometimes we've been plainly warned that stop what you're doing it's going to end in trouble but we just carry on regardless and then let trouble just before. I pray today that God will help us anywhere where we've been warned that we will stop and listen to the warning. I pray for our young people where you've been warned. Don't just carry on and wait to be an, an accident. Wait to be part of Satan's victories over the body of Christ. Don't wait for Satan and his, and his uh, fellows to start boasting that, oh, we got that one. You know, Peter knew the prophecy but it didn't keep him alert. Child of God, we are doing this Bible study today. It's like Jesus giving us a warning too. So after now, we have to stay alert. We have to start praying. Lord, help me. Peter's fear of men stimulated a fleshy response. And so he started to deny Jesus. The fleshy response overrode the spirit. And that's not just unique to Apostle Peter. It can happen to us as well. We're the flesh. 
whether it's anger, whether it's fear or whatever else, the flesh sometimes can override the spirit. So your spirit knows what to do. Your spirit knows the word of God. And then the flesh kicks into gear and takes over. Peter began to, you know, curse, deny and act in a fleshy manner, which caused him to forget what the Lord Jesus had said. And all this started with overconfidence. Rod Martin says, you know, in our days, we can also have this overconfidence. How can it manifest? Number one, I don't need to pray about it. Oh, I'm experienced with this type of thing. Oh, you know, I am educated. I, I've got a master's. I've got this. I've got, I'm, uh, you know, I'm educated. I, I have a PhD. You know, I have all this. I don't need to pray. I have sense. I'm going to do it. Go back to the Bible. Look at it. In the days of Joshua, when the Gibeonites were playing games with the Israelites and cheating and lying and willing and dealing so that they could enter a covenant with them, if Joshua had prayed, he would have realized there was a problem in the camp. Holy Spirit, God would have told him, these Gibeonites are lying. Don't be moved by their moldy stale bread and their torn clothes and their raggedy appearance. They're your neighbors. They are lying. But they didn't pray. They went by what they could see. They thought, ah, oh, even a blind man can see these people have come from afar. They are dirty. Their clothes are dirty. Their breads turned moldy. They are tired. They've come from far, so they didn't ask God. And many times we are like that as well. We don't ask God. We start the day without prayer. We don't commit things into the hands of God, and then things go wrong. Because things are not always the way they appear. There are some things we take for granted. We think God is in a matter, but maybe God is not in that thing. You need to ask God. And then another thing, I don't need to read the Bible every day or study God's word. I know the Bible. Child of God, every day we need fresh bread, fresh bread, the word of God. We need it every day. If we don't read the word, you will miss what God is trying to say. Some people might fool themselves and think, I don't need God's help. I'm educated. I'm qualified. I know what I'm doing. I can handle this project. I'm good at this sort of thing. But you'll be making a mistake. Some people think, I don't need godly counsel. They don't ask for any counsel. They don't ask pastor for counsel. They don't ask elders for counsel. They don't ask anybody. They think I'm intelligent. In fact, I'll ask chat GPT. I'll ask AI or I'll ask Google but we need to ask for godly counsel. And then some people think, I don't need anyone's help. I'll do it my way. And again, that's a trap. You know, you could extend it to anything. You know, I don't need my husband, don't need my wife, don't need my parents. Oh, I can do this on my own. And then afterwards, you now fail. So we must know every day we need God. We need the people he's put around us, the believers around us. We need the church of God. No believer can survive as a lone ranger because the church wasn't dis designed like that. We are the body of Christ and every part of the body has a part to play in our lives. Warren Wesley says, you know, Peter's self-confident boasting is a warning to us that none of us really knows his heart. Remember Jeremiah 17, 9, you know. The heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? We can fail. Even in that place where we thought it was a point of strength for us, in that place where you think you're really strong, you can fail. Abraham, our father Abraham, is called the father of faith. So his greatest strength was his faith. Yet his faith failed him when he went down to Egypt and he lied to Pharaoh and said Sarah was his sister. The father of faith lost faith was afraid that the Egyptians would steal his beautiful wife and kill him and all this. He had this kind of horror movie going on in his brain and he lost faith, even though he's the father of faith. Now, if the father of faith could lose faith, what about us? Little children of faith, what about us? So every day we need God to help us. Look at Moses. Moses' strength was meekness and he got a commendation from God as being the meekest man in the world. He was meek. He wasn't pretending. He wasn't like, oh, practicing hypocrisy. Moses was meek. Meekness means strength under control. It means he was a patient person, slow to anger and all this. Yet he lost his temper, spoke rashly with his lips, hit the rock instead of spe speaking to the rock 
and says, you rebels, do you want us to bring water for you out of the rock? And he hit the rock. And that signified smiting Jesus twice who had already the first time they hit the rock that represented the crucifixion the second time he was not supposed to touch the rock but with anger he lost his temper and he spoke and the meekest man in the world lost the ticket to Canaan he could not enter Canaan because of his anger so that tells you you might sit here thinking you know I don't have a problem with anger I'm very calm very hard to get me angry. And then the next day, you're so angry that you're beating people up in Piccadilly Gardens and people are absolutely shocked. Peter himself was a brave man. He was a brave man. You know, he had courage. He had like a very strong personality. He wasn't a coward. He usually was able to speak up. But on this day, his courage failed him and he denied the Lord three times. Going back again, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls because the father of faith one day lost faith. The one who was the meekest man in the world one day got angry and he did a, a, something that the Lord would not excuse, Mr. the promised land. Peter, a brave man, denied the Lord. Whatever you think is your strength, you can still fall there if you don't rely on God. Let's go forward. Verse 32. Then they went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit down here while I pray. Now that word Gethsemane, um, Bible scholars uh, teach us that that word means um, the place of the crushing. This is a place where they used to crush olives to bring forth olive oil, olive oil representing the anointing. So this garden, Gethsemane, is, is like teaching us something as well about our journey with the Lord. Every child of God who's ever going to manifest any level of anointing must go through their own Gethsemane. You've got to go through a place of crushing, a place where you come to the end of yourself, a place where you know I can't depend on myself. I am helpless without God. When you're completely crushed and you rely on the Lord, the anointing begins to flow. That's why you see when we know false prophets by the level of arrogance that they carry. We know false prophets and workers of iniquity by the level of arrogance. They are not broken. They have not gone to Gethsemane and you can automatically tell that this level of arrogance does not come when you've been to a place of crushing, when you've been to a place where the oil has flowed out of affliction, out of of challenges and out of God taking you through a school, a school of faith. You know, there's a way you are when you've gone through the place of crushing. And I'm just saying this to us, you know, all of us as believers, we will go through our own Gethsemane. You might not have been there yet. You will go through it if you want the anointing to flow. If you've been there, you will know that there's a certain turning point when you went through a crushing and it transformed your Christianity. I had mine. I've often told you this testimony years ago. Come to the end of yourself. When doctors sit you down and say, there's no cure. We don't know what we're going to do. Just prepare to die someday, you know, soon. That sort of thing. It brings you to a Gethsemane and you have to lean on the Lord then at that time. So Jesus came to this place in Gethsemane, this place of crushing where he went through pain. The Bible says, even though he was a son, you can find this in the book of Hebrews, even though Jesus was a son, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. So if the son of God learned to obey God through the things he suffered, how much more you and I, we are also sons and daughters of the Most High God. Some of the suffering we're going through is not because the village witches are on our case. Our village people have not come for us or anything of that sort. It just means that you are learning obedience. You are learning the ways of the Lord. So verse 33, and Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be struck with terror and amazement and deeply troubled and depressed. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sad. My mind, my will, my emotions, exceedingly sad. I am overwhelmed right now with grief. I'm overwhelmed so that it almost kills me. Jesus was in such a terrible place. Imagine you are Peter, you are James, you are John. You have a friend, a friend that you followed, you rely on, you look upon. And the friend is vulnerable with you and tells you this and says, I am exceedingly sad. I am overwhelmed with grief. It almost kills me. At this point, if your friend is telling you this, it tells you that they need you. They need your support. They need your help. If today I called my friend and said to my friend, I'm exceedingly sad. I'm overwhelmed with grief. It almost kills me. The last thing you'd expect is for your friends, you know, to just go to bed, to just be sleeping and act like 
they didn't hear what you said. Jesus says to his friends, his disciples, remain here, keep awake, and be watching. And going a little further than them, he fell on the ground and kept praying that if it were possible, the fatal hour of his crucifixion might pass from him. And he was saying, Abba, Father, my daddy, my daddy, your baby is here. Everything is possible for you, Father. Take away this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus was speaking to the Father, really heartbroken, overwhelmed with grief because he Unlike us, most times we don't really have a good idea of what's coming. Sometimes even when the problem starts, we don't always have a full picture of what's coming. But Jesus had a full picture. He had a full understanding of what the cross would entail. He knew that you'd have to carry sins, all our sins, and be abominable and, you know, carry guilt. You know how you feel when you've sinned. You know, Jesus was going to carry the sins of the whole world. Imagine the grief of it all, of just carrying that filth and that weight, and then just being rejected and knowing that you're going to have to go to hell and be separated from your father, whom you've never been separated from. This was like a huge confrontation that Jesus was facing and he's praying and he's telling the disciples how painful it is. And he's asking Abba, but notice again, we've said this before, Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done. And often as Christians, this is our biggest challenge being able to pray and say, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because oftentimes we want our will to be done. You know, father has a will. Sometimes the will of the father is not palatable to us. Sometimes the will of the father, we want to avoid it. It's painful. It's difficult. We don't want it. We just want to do our own way. We want a shortcut. We want an easy way out. Sometimes the will of the Father is not palatable to us. And sometimes we just plainly ignore God. God says, do this, and we just don't do it. And of course, it has disastrous consequences. Jesus was submitted to the Father despite the horror of the cross. And he knew what was coming. He said, not your will, but not my will, sorry, but your will be done. And he said they began to be very distressed and troubled. And you see these verbs, they depict those strong reactions and emotions, you know, pain, sorrow, deep emotional and physical pain and distress, heaviness, you know, sorry for the typo there, but grief or sorrow, you know, grief, grief, lot of grief that the Lord was carrying at this time. And so that's why Jesus knows what you're feeling. He knows what you're going through and he's able to help you. He's our, he's our high priest. He has experienced grief. He knows pain. He knows emotional pain. He knows physical pain. He experienced all this in the garden of crushing in Gethsemane. He became distressed and amazed. He was astonished. He, it was an intense state of perplexity, being perplexed and just not really you know, being okay. He was greatly disturbed. He was in deep distress. He was frightened. He was alarmed because things were coming that were going to be horrific. We know how beaten up he was. We know what the trial was like. We know what, you know, from reading, we, none of us have ever experienced anything of that sort. This is what the Lord Jesus went through. And then, like I said, he has told his disciples, his friends, remain here and keep watch. And it's, it's a command like for immediate obedience. Do this now. Remain here. Keep watch. So they remained in the physical location, but they were asleep. They were not watching. Same as us. We are here on planet Earth right now. And Jesus said to us, occupy till I come. He's expecting us to bring the kingdom of heaven in the spaces and in the dimensions where we are dwelling. But how many of us are actually watching? We are here physically, but are we here spiritually? Even when we gather as a church for Bible study, for prayers, are you there spiritually? Are you really watching? Are you abiding with Jesus? Is he abiding in you? Or have you gone to sleep and left Jesus to sort it out himself? It's interesting to note here that Jesus was saying, stay awake, wake up. It's like a verb for mental alertness where you are alert in every way. But James, Peter, and John, they fell asleep three times instead of staying awake and alert. 
And that tells you that to stay alert, you have to really be intentional about it. To attend Bible study, you've got to be intentional. To come for prayer meetings, you've got to be intentional. To study the Bible on your own, you have to be intentional. Everything we're going to have to do for the kingdom, we have to be intentional. Satan doesn't mind you watching Netflix all hours. Start from when you arrive home from work, finish at 3 a.m. You will never fall asleep. He'll keep you awake to watch more and more and just be going lost. But if you start Bible study, you might start to feel sleepy. If you start to pray, you might start to get hungry and get tired. So you've got to be intentional and say, no, I'm not getting up from here until I finish reading. You know, like when we do prayer line in the morning, I, you know, get up out of bed and I walk upstairs and I sit by my work desk so that, you know, it's like that demarcation of I'm no longer sleeping. Because if you lie down on the bed, tendencies, you're going to doze off and the prayer leader will be just talking to themselves whilst you're sleeping. So they had to stay awake, but they had to do something intentional to stay awake. Remember, Judas has already departed to go and betray the Lord. Jesus knew where Judas was going. And he says to the disciples, keep watch because that traitor was going to come with his entourage to come and arrest Jesus. And Jesus was relying on these disciples. And he came back again, found them sleeping. Verse 37 of Mark 14. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Have you not the strength to keep awake and watch with me for one hour? Keep awake and watch and pray constantly that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went again and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came back and found them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what, to ans what answer to give him. Child of God, this warning is for us as well. Are you not able to keep awake and watch with me for one hour? You know, for some of us, some people have never even prayed for an hour all their lives. You know, whoever's unseen with noise, please can you mute yourself? So we don't have the noise in the recording, please. Thank you. So even in our days now, some believers have never actually um, prayed for an hour. Just to pray one hour is difficult. The only prayer they pray is fire brigade emergency prayer. You know, God, good morning. I'm running. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. And they're going, you know, when you're alone at home, you've never prayed for an hour. Are you not able to watch for one hour? Jesus has given us even almost like a minimum prayer session. He says, keep awake and watch and pray constantly. You can't say, I prayed on Sunday. I prayed on Saturday. Constantly watch and pray. You're at work. Be praying in your heart. You're everywhere. You're on the road. You're driving in your car. Speak up. Pray so that you might not enter into temptation. Jesus is telling us that the antidote for temptation is prayer. He says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In our spirit, we are loaded. We're full of the Holy Ghost. We're full of the presence of God. But the flesh is weak. If we don't tame the flesh in the place of prayer, the flesh will rise up like it did in the time of Peter and cause him to deny the Lord Jesus. Jesus kept repeating these words and going back to pray, but these three kept going back to sleep. Thankfully, they learned an important lesson. And after the resurrection, they, they started a different path. May we also learn this lesson today and go on that path of prayer. We're rounding up now uh, for today. We'll finish off the Bible passage by God's grace next week. And then Jesus comes back and says, are you still sleeping? Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough of that. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinful men. Men whose way or nature is to act in opposition to God. Get up. Let's be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And at once, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the 12 apostles, and with him a crowd of men with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the Sanhedrin. We're going to look at this um, more next week. But look at it. Jesus comes back and says the third time, you and I, how many warnings have we had to keep our prayer life on fire? Are you still sleeping? Are we sleeping? I mean, by sleeping, are we switched off from the warnings of God? Are we switched off from our assignments that God has given us? It's time to wake up. The hour has come. And Jesus is saying to us what he said to those disciples, wake up. When a believer is in a time of trouble, we have to pray.
the head of the church himself, Jesus, has supplied us the pattern here. He prayed. Even the night before, he had already prayed on the Mount of Olives. Here we see him praying again. You and I, we cannot do better than the head of the church. If the head of the church prays when there's trouble, you and I have to pray. Both the Old and New Testaments give the same kind of advice for when trouble comes. Psalm 50 verse 15, God says, call upon me in the time of trouble. I will deliver you. Um, James 5 13, is anyone afflicted? Let him pray. Prayer is the receipt which Jacob used when he feared his brother Esau. Prayer is the receipt which Job used when his property and children were suddenly taken from them. Prayer is what Hezekiah used when Sennacherib's threatening letter arrived in Isaiah 36. Prayer is what the son of God was not ashamed to use in the days of his flesh. So if all these patriarchs and the Lord Jesus prayed, you are not exempted. Pray. You can't keep saying, I've told a, an apostle of God to pray for me. I've given my name to the prophet on the mountain of prayer. I've sent my name to Jerry Eze or whoever. No, you have to pray because that's what a believer has to do. So we're going to finish there tonight. Um, thank you for listening, anybody. Does an, a, a, anyone have anything to add or any questions before we pray or any prayer points that you want us to pray? based on what we've studied tonight. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Ugo. Thank you so much for, for this uh, topic. Um, Thank you, Bra Ugo. Yeah, I'm, I'm com I'll come in from the point of a prayer request. Um, like you rightly mentioned that it's so easy to say that um, I cannot do something i can never find myself to you know participate in anything that is not of god yeah but you know when when situations hit very close to home you yeah. know you might find yourself entertaining you know things that you you would even look back and wonder you know what was i what, what was i even what was thinking, I thinking? So, mm. yeah so it's mine is coming from it uh, as a prayer request for God to continue to give us the strength to praise God. You know, thank you, my sister. Identify. Thank you for the yeah. Auntie Chi, can you hear you. us? Yes, Auntie I can Chi. hear you. Yeah, bro, Ugo is still speaking. Can we oh, sorry, let him sorry. finish? Thank you. Sis. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry, oh, sorry. Ugo. It's okay. Uh, no, no problem, dear. Auntie. No problem, Auntie. Just for God to continue to give us the strength to be aware of the decisions we make and Amen. also to continue to depend on him for guidance. You know, we should we should, you know, depend on him completely, not on ourselves. Amen. Thank you, Braugo. I've written the prayer point down. We'll come back to it. Auntie Chi. Would you like to go ahead? Anti Sorry. Chichi? Okay. Yes, yes. Right. Um, I just want to thank you again, my sister. Thank I you. just want us to um look at what Peter did. Even he fell, you know, what happened? He he humbled himself and um came back. And as for forgiveness, you know, he still, he knew that he has failed, you know, and there is no other way but to go back to God, you know. So no matter what we're going to, what we have done, you know, if we think we have failed, don't give up. Go back because the enemy wants to keep you away, you know, Amen. to stay there. God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Auntie Che. I've noted that down for our prayers as well. Does anyone else have anything to add on? Yes, my sister. It's just an Good evening, sir. Yeah, evening, mm. evening. It's just an observation, probably in the line, some of it in the line of what my wife and I just said about uh, Peter's um, confidence and, uh, you know, sort of, self-esteem about himself in this matter. Although we know that what was happening is has already been prophetically determined, but also we need to apply it to our own 
day-to-day -day sort of uh, relationship and uh, journey in this uh, our Christian life. I think some of it you have already mentioned it, but what I wanted to say is that um, no matter what we feel about ourselves and how how confident we think we we we, we are, God knows the real us, and and He knows the real us when He saved us. So so that's that's the first observation. But uh, another thing I want I also wanted to say is that uh, few people actually know and admit the truth about themselves. And that is also something we need to be aware of. Uh, but in as much as people can overrate themselves and, and things like that, God knows the absolute truth about each one of us. Yes, sir. We need, to, we need to know that we cannot hide from God. God knows us inside hey, out. Hey. Amen. And, and the other thing you've also mentioned there is that we need to always depend on the Lord because we are he is the one who is capable of anything, and we we are sinners. We are sinners. We need to see ourselves every time we go to God that we are sinners that needs His help. Yeah, yeah. And and, and the other thing my wife said there is also in the in the midst of this failure of Peter, we can also learn something that God can forgive and use somebody even when they have failed. So he can still forgive and use us, even if we, we have disappointed him or, or that we have failed sometimes and, and, and bounced back. Okay, Amen. So that, 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 those are the sort of observations I, I made, but thank you for the study. Okay, sir, thank you. Does anyone else have anything else to add before we pray? Good evening. Uh, mine is Good a evening. question is a question really um at the beginning of the of the um, of the topic we you you sort of mentioned um israel and uh people who sort of you know like wanting their demise or you know the cancellation of them because at the moment it's like a hot topic with whatever is going on with gaza and things like that yeah. how then do you navigate that sort of current affairs what what are sort of people's opinions? How, you know, as a Christian, how do you sort of answer those questions when they're brought to you or they're in a discussion format? Yeah, I, I'll give yeah. you my personal view and um, if other people have views as well, they can share them. Um, the first thing is this, is that if the Bible is telling me that, um, remember the Apostle Paul, when he was teaching, he says, you know, Israel's ignorance is really for the ignorance uh, of the fact that Jesus is Messiah was really for our benefit and that we've been grafted into them. They are like an olive tree that the Gentiles, so the nations that are not um, Jewish have been grafted onto them and that we cannot then participate in cursing the olive tree that we've been grafted on because when you look at it even as Christians the gospel is built upon the law and the prophets of which Israel is in that um, foundation so that we ought to be praying um, for Israel's eyes to be opened to their messiah does that mean that we will support the political policies of um Israel or whatever their government are doing. It doesn't mean that uh, we are those people who are going to be saying, look, Israel does no wrong and we are always there standing for Israel. No, we don't need to say that, but we do need to pray for Israel and we do need to know that Israel is in the plan of God. So now when you're in conversations about Israel, what we have to be careful to do is not to curse Israel or to say things that would be a curse um, upon the nation of Israel. So if people are crying about children being killed in Gaza, obviously it is painful for a child to be killed in Gaza. That is a painful thing. That is just like if there was a child killed in, in, in um, any of our, our states in Africa, any child killed in the UK. It's upsetting to all of us. When um, Hamas bomb Israel and they kill people in Israel, Again, that's painful for anyone to hear. We are praying for the Israelites. We are praying for the Palestinians. But what you find, especially like I work, um, you know, in a context where 99% of the people are always cursing Israel. And, you know, 
just like Hamas can do no wrong, but it's actually unbalanced. And so as a result, I and uh, a reverend who works with me at work, we always, you know, say kind of, you know, we stay with the facts of the matter. A ch children have been killed. Okay. You know, it is horrendous. It is difficult. We pray for, you know, a resolution of this matter. But to speak against Israel, to speak against Israel as a nation and to speak against what God has given them and want them to give up the land that we know that God has given to them. I will not do that because that is me going against what the scriptures are telling me. I'm not going to wish that Israel be uprooted from where they are. I'm not going to wish that Israel lose the land that God gave them because the Bible is 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 clear that what they've been given, they've been given by God. Um, now, Israel is not a Christian nation as such at this point in time. Yes, we have a lot of Messianic Jews, but remember the challenges that they are facing, that they'll continue to face, and through the great tribulation that we discussed on Sunday, those challenges are about the fact that they denied and rejected their Messiah when he came the first time. So they are not like a, a, a nation, a Christian nation. They are a nation that we are praying for, that we always keep in our prayers because the Bible tells us in some, pray for the peace of Israel. And we are praying because in, at a future date, you know, they will be saved. And when Jesus comes back after the battle of Armageddon, that is where his headquarters is going to be. At. It's going to be at Jerusalem when he comes back at the second time, the millennium reign. When he comes from the millennium reign, it will start from there. So Israel is, is there prophetically within the plan of God. But it doesn't mean that Israel is perfect or that everything they are doing is perfect. It's just they are a, a nation of prophecy and we will not curse them. We will continue to pray for them. I don't know if that answers your question, Paris. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no further contributions, shall we go ahead and pray? We have quite a few prayer points that we've been given here. Let's start off with the prayer point that Brother Ugo gave us. And it's a very crucial prayer um, that let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. First Corinthians 10, 21. So we want to ask God for that strength because there'll be times when you'll be hard pressed. There'll be times when matters will be close to your heart, where there might be a shortcut here and there that people are offering you, where there might look like there is a way out, you know, of your predicament, but that way out might not be the way of God. Let us ask for God's strength and his grace to help us to continually make the right decisions. We were praying the other day that we will hear a voice behind our ear saying, this is the way walk in it. Let's ask that God help me to be sub submissive to your will. Help me to be submissive to the Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord, to make the decisions that are in line with your will. May I be that man, that woman, that even in the midst of temptation, I am able to do what exactly you want me to do. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we have learned tonight, oh God, that when we are self-confident, it leads to a fall. Where we think, oh God, we've already arrived or we've already made it, it leads to a fall. We have seen that Apostle Peter fell that day because he was overconfident. He was self-confident. He was not watchful. He thought he could do it in his own strength. Father, we don't want to be caught in the same trap. Any area in our lives that we've not submitted to you, Lord, we are submitting to you right now. In all our lives, in our marriages, in our relationships, in our family life, in our jobs, in the businesses you've given us, in the ministry. Lord, whatever we do, we are just asking that you would help us. That we would not do anything by our own strength. Father God, when we are serving you in church, in anything we do, may we rely on you, Lord. We will never be self-confident. Whatever we are going to present to you, to the people of God, may it be what, Lord, we have waited upon you for in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, help us, oh God. Let every idea of self-confidence be uprooted from us. We pray the same prayer for all our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for our family members, spouses. We pray Pray for children, children's children, any of our youth, Lord, who think that they are confident, who think that they can do A, B, C, and D. We are asking that you help them to see 
that we can only be confident in you, Lord, because you will neither leave us nor forsake us. You are our strength. The Bible said the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. Lord, we bring ourselves to you, our strong tower, and we receive your help. That, Lord, none of us will fall into error because of our pride. Let pride be uprooted and let it be replaced with humility and dependence on God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's go to um, Auntie Chichi's um, suggestion. We see that later on when we read the book of uh, John, the Gospel of John, the last chapter, we see that Peter was restored. And by the time we get to the book of Acts, we see that he did a lot for the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He did not remain in his sin. Yes, the Bible says a righteous man may fall seven times, but you will still get up seven times. Don't fall and then just remain there sitting and saying, oh, well, I failed. Oh, well, the church is laughing at me. They've put my name on Twitter, on Facebook or whatnot. When we fail, we cannot remain in failure because 1 John 1 9 said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we know that in the Bible, the Lord never used any perfect person. All the people we read about in the Bible, they were all humans who had flaws. They failed. Even King David, who is so famous, he failed. They all failed, but God used them. So let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that we will not remain in failure. Wherever we have failed, Lord, we depend on your word. You said if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Every Every area where we failed. Lord, let your mercy lift us up today. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse us. Restore us to every position we've fallen from. Where we have fallen from grace. Let the blood of Jesus restore us. We pray for all our brothers and sisters in Christ, our family members, anyone else around us who has failed, anyone who has fallen, that you would restore them, oh God, that you would put them back, oh God, in line with your will, and that their destinies would be restored in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus. You say the righteous man might fall seven times, uh, but you will get up. Uh. Father, however way we have fallen, we receive the grace to get up and to do what you asked us to do. We receive the grace to complete our assignments uh, in the name of Jesus. We know the devil is a liar. He wants us to remain in guilt. But Father God, we know that godly sorrow leads to repentance. We have already discussed this before as a church. Lord, enable our godly sorrow to lead us to repentance, to lead us to rest restoration in the name of Jesus. We will not be like Judas Iscariot. When Judas failed, he hanged himself and he, he took himself to hell. But when Peter failed, he repented. His godly sorrow led him to repentance and he was restored. Father, we pray the same for all of us. Whoever has fallen, let godly sorrow overwhelm them and lead them to repentance. We will not be those who sin and are not bothered that we've sinned. We will not sin and then just act like nothing happened. But when we sin, Lord, may our... May, May the Spirit of God remove our peace until we have repented in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for forgiving us all our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, going back to the point that Uncle Duru gave us, you know, Jesus knew Peter. Peter did not know himself. Jesus could see that Peter was going to fall. Peter could not see. In the same manner, God knows us. He knows where the traps are. That's why... In fact, we are in a good position because the one who is omnipotent and omniscient knows where we could possibly fall. And because he knows when we pray to him, he will reveal to us and also give us the strength to jump and pass that scandal on, to jump and pass the trap. I want us to pray and say, Lord, any way where I'm acting with self-confidence and Lord, I'm about to fail. I, may, I pray for revelation in those areas of my life where I'm about to fall. Lord, reveal to me and give me the grace to prevail over the temptation in the name of Jesus. Because he said, there is no temptation that has befallen any human being, which is not common to all men. He says, with every temptation, God has created a way of escape. Lord, wherever the way of escape is in my life, 
right now. I pray, open my eyes to see it. Open my eyes to see the way of escape. Where, Lord, uh, God, wherever the enemy has planned evil for us and he wants us to fail, mighty God, help us to escape. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, we are praying, O oh God, that you will help us. You said, Lord, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Father God, there is no temptation that comes to us that other human beings have not been through. You said, God, you are faithful. You will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to carry. Lord, we pray that, Lord, you said, with every temptation that you've made a way of escape, Father, show us the escape route in all the temptations Satan has planned for us. Show us the escape route. Lead us down the escape route. Oh, give us revelation. Give us wisdom. Give us insight. Father, we pray this prayer for all our family members, our spouses, our children, our children's children, whoever right now is in the midst of temptation. Lord, show them the way of escape. Open that door. Open their eyes and let them escape in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Help us, mighty God. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. In, help us. Nobody here will be so self-confident as to end up in trouble. But Father God, we will be those people who will see the way out. In Jesus' name, amen. Also connected to this prayer, I shared with us that Greek word scandalon, the bait of Satan. You know, he, he, the Bible says in Ephesians 6.10, that finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He says, put on the full armor of God so that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So that we can stand against the wiles of the devil, Ephesians 6.11. And what are the wells? It's his, all his schemes. All, you know, it's carefully thought out. He's not random. When he wants people to fail, he carefully plans it out. The kingdom of darkness is not random. Let us pray that, Father Lord, any scandal on, any trap that has been placed on my way to cause my faith to fail, to cause me to stumble. We, we, we discussed that Abraham was a father of faith. He lost faith and lied about his wife. Moses was a meek man, gentle. And yet one day he was so angry, he missed the promised land. So Peter was courageous, but one day, look at how he failed. Let us pray. Whatever trap, whatever bait Satan has put in our way to cause us to stumble. Father, in the name of Jesus, let your Holy Spirit cause us to jump and pass that trap. Whatever trap, whatever offense, any way Satan wants us to be offended with God, wants us to lose our faith, wants us to stagger with unbelief, wants us to fall away. Every stumbling block impediment that the enemy has put in our way to cause us to fail. Any way Satan is working on our case, to smite the shepherd and scatter the sheep. Father, we are praying, deliver us right now. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, Father, I'm praying even for our leaders, oh God, every leader we have in the church, our leaders will not fall because you said, Lord, when they smite the shepherd, the sheep scatter, our leaders will not fail. In the church of God, give our leaders godly wisdom. Give them godly revelation and insight in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give even in our families, our parents, fathers, mothers, give us wisdom. We will not fail because if the fathers and mothers fail, that children will be scattered. Father, we will not fail in all the places where you've given us positions of authority, in our jobs, where we have leadership roles. We will not fail. The bait of Satan will not catch us. We will not be offended in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, help us. All of us will be able to stand by faith in all the roles you've given us. We will stand in the mighty name of Jesus. We will not fail. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Brethren, we learned that this thing that happened to them had been prophesied 500 years before the event. For me, it means 500 years before 2024 May, God already knew what I will have to overcome in this month. God already knew my destiny 500 years before. He already knew it. So it means that story already has a good conclusion. You remember, you know, he said in Jeremiah that I know the plans that I have for you, plans for good and not for evil. 
to give you hope, to give you a future, to bring you to your expected end. So if God said this in Jeremiah 29, 11, and we are seeing here that 500 years before God already knew this, it must give us confidence today. Whatever I'm going through is going to end well. The good prophecies that we've been given, they will come to pass. We must not doubt. We must not shake. Let us pray again as we close tonight that Father God, I receive that grace to hold on to the hem of your garment, to know that my my life is not in the hands of the devil. Lord, my life, oh God, is in your hands because the plans you have for me are not plans of evil. They are plans for good. They are plans for peace. They are to give me a hope and to give me a future, to bring me to my expected end. That's how I'm convinced, Lord, today that I will not fail. My spouse, my children, my brothers and sisters in Christ, all our families that we represent, we will not fail. It has already been prophesied. All the good prophecies you have given us. Thank you that they are coming to pass. We hold on to the hem of your garment. We refuse to be moved. We refuse to be shaken. We refuse to be discouraged. We refuse to be confused. We refuse to be bewildered. Lord, we hang on to your truth because you are faithful. 80% of your prophecies about your death and resurrection and your second coming, they've been fulfilled. So Lord, we believe that one day you are coming again. You are coming again. The second coming, we will see you. One day there will be a new heavens and a new earth. One day we will enjoy eternity in your presence. Lord, help us to never forget that you are faithful and true. In the mighty name of Jesus, thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, brethren. Because of our time, we will close now. Does anyone have any other prayer points you want us to pray before we close? Amen. If there's no other prayer point, let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you again for what you've reminded us tonight. Lord, please let your word be expanded in our hearts. However way, Lord, you want us to get deeper insight. Father, each and every one of us, there's a different area you want us to really concentrate on out of this Bible study. Father, please help us not to forget. Help us to concentrate on that area and to come back next week, Lord, having been strengthened and empowered by your truth. In the name of Jesus, as we prepare to go to sleep now, we pray the blood of Jesus over all our families, Lord. We pray for divine protection. May our homes be preserved and protected. May our dreams be protected and preserved. May, oh God, our destinies be protected and preserved. That the enemies that fly about in the night, they are not permitted to fly over our homes, to fly inside our homes, or to interfere with any one of us or any of our children or spouses or family members. We decree and declare divine safety. We draw a bloodline of the blood of Jesus around all our family members and decree and declare, touch not my anointed, do my promise prophets no harm. All of us are under the shadow of Almighty God. We will wake up with strength in the morning to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. May we please Amen. share the grace. Amen. 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 May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and forevermore. Amen. Amen.